So one day I was singing in the subways of New York City and this guy came up and asked for a request and he was like, can you sing Pavarotti? And I just thought, oh my God, this fool has no idea that he just asked me to sing another opera singer. He was thinking opera and the only thing that came to mind was Pavarotti, not knowing that he was asking about a singer, not actually asking for a song. So like the equivalent would be if I went up to somebody and I was like, oh my God, can you sing Michael Jackson? Yes, like it translates, it's like they want you to sing in the style of Michael Jackson, but they're not giving you an actual song. You'd be like, okay, but like, which era, which song of Michael Jackson, like there's just so much. I just want to make this video today about like operatic styles and relating them to what it's like to enjoy entertainment today because I see all of the similarities. I see how these things fit together, but clearly the world does not. <laughs> Hey, Cassandra here with Opera Appreciation for Black Folks. And on this channel, I work to make opera equitable by teaching you how to appreciate a little bit more opera in your daily life. Okay, so one question that I get a lot that I hear often from people who don't know anything about opera is what kind of opera is there? Is there different languages? Like clearly there's an understanding that it's coming from a different place or how many languages opera is in. And as I said in other videos, opera is literally in any language that people speak in. Opera is an art form where there is singing and music together to tell a story. So that happens in a lot of different languages and a lot of different countries. It's classified by different names, but I'm gonna break down some of the major players in opera that started it and kind of set the tone and inspired other countries to do the same or transform opera to be their own thing and how that like manifests into how we appreciate entertainment today. The three big players are the Italians who birthed opera, the French, and the Germans. The Italians were like, oh my gosh, the human voice is amazing. They were finding out a really wonderful way to concentrate on honoring the human voice. So when Italians are started with opera, their first claim to fame was what we call bel canto. And bel canto literally means that, good singing or beautiful singing. And so bel canto is where, I don't know if you've heard the term of park and bark, where <laughs> it's literally somebody that's just standing there and focusing on how beautiful their voice is. And that's really a really crude definition of what Italian singing is. Because so composers like Mozart and Handel and Rossini and Bellini and Donizetti wrote a lot of operas that had lots of fast movement and have these moments where they would just stop and honor like how amazing this voice can move. What's sort of also really important about bel canto singing is that there's a lot of light, long, intricate vocal patterning that expresses a lot of meaning and emotions all through the voice. So <laughs> So while there might not have been a lot of dramaticism, like physical movement on stage, there was this focus on how amazing the voice itself could move. They just came out and did an amazing thing. They were like, hey, cool, opera, this thing, right? And then the French and the Germans were like, hmm, 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 adopted it, and some, they rejected certain things or accepted different, uh, different oh, things. So, so the French embraced some, but not all of Italian singing. They really liked the idea of focusing on the voice, but they also really wanted to focus on the enunciation of the texts. And they objected from like the sung word being like too littered with too many things. They didn't like it to be obstructed. They just wanted to be beautiful, beautiful singing without a lot of movement. And style and there 
are French operas, but there are way more Italian operas than there are French operas because it was just, Italian opera was just way more popular, way more exciting to listen to. Um, and then the Germans were literally like, anti the idea of singing with a full sound and focusing only on the voice. They wanted to focus on other things like the storytelling. Theirs was very text-based. Their music reflected the texts and they focused on what we would call singspiel, so singing and speaking together, which afforded a lot of like acting that was because more stories were coming but these were also more fanciful stories they were based in maybe comic or romantic plot lines that had a lot of magic and uh, folklore hymns and a lot of strophic or repetitive tunes that we beat here over and over again strophic singing where it sounds the same the tune sounds the same but the text changes the germans came up with that and they were like hey we're just gonna do this beginning of pop these folk songs where they're accompanying themselves and the text helped to support the singing. You know, that came out of the Germanic style. So we've had composers like Handel, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, and we had Wagner knocking it out of the park of merging comedies and romances and storytelling with music and drama and adding really great, fantastic music to that. We have to thank the Germans for that influence. And so Italians, so the Italians were like, oh my gosh, singing. The French were like, <laughs> um, yay, singing, but you know, ah, uh, the language and let's not get too, uh, let's not, let's not make it too fussy, you know, let's make it clean, you know? And then the Germans were like, no, we really love the text and we want to focus on the story and we want to make sure that while the voice is important, we won't want to sacrifice the story for the singing. We want the two things to come together and marry well. And then that sort of influenced what we call Verismo opera. The Italians called it their form of realism. So Verismo opera sought to portray the world in greater realism. It was less about these fanciful stories between kings and queens and and biblical stories or things that felt maybe separate from us that were not reflective of where we are today but were things that we could aspire to or to inspire us or to teach us something you know se essentially separate from us but here they're taking real world stories and bringing them back to the people so things like La Boheme which is about portraying poor people suffering. Like that's the first time that was really done. Up until then, people were always imagining ourselves being in court or a king or a queen or a countess, basically things that feel otherworldly from us or away from what our social standing. And then we have Verismo, which is like, no, 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 we are actually telling people's true stories. We're not um, separating people by class. We're just telling honest stories. And so that is, that inspired things like Pagliacci with the clown and Tosca and La Boheme, which is, you know, about four poor bohemians and one dying of cold and fever. So it's just like, who, you know, com compared to watching, uh, <laughs> say Mozart's Die Zappelflöte, watching a princess be chased around by her queen mother of the night who is a witch and her <laughs> You know, those are just very fanciful ideas that don't feel like relatable to the real world. It would be like the equivalent of being on like, I'm a total Star Wars fan. So it would be like the equivalent of being on like Tatooine and watching some Star Wars person zoom off from one planet to the other and you know fighting for the rebels and the resistance and while we can like totally appreciate the fancifulness of that we are very clear that that's not real 
right? We connect with it because they can be real human stories and connections, or we just like the story and how it unfolds and like the fan fanciful fancifulness of it all, um, and feeling familiar themes, like hearing that Star Wars theme. We're like, total, sorry, total nerd about that. But you get what I'm saying. Um, so those things created a very different experience for the opera goer, which was the movie goer of the previous time of of that age of the 18th and 19th century because we didn't have movie theaters and actually if you go through a lot of towns in the US all the theater there was a time when and I think this started to happen after one of the world wars I don't have to check my history but those opera theaters then turned into the future movie theaters because it was the same idea of like going to the theater to sit down and watch entertainment and watch a story be played out to you that you could connect to. So that's how those two things are the same. The only difference is that now the orchestra is not sitting in the theater with us playing what's being shown on the screen, you know, uh, or play or accompanying what's happening, but there is an orchestra playing. Like we hear the orchestra in the movie in Star Wars, it's like all orchestra, hello, John Williams, right? I have other stuff written here, but like, here's the thing. Opera is a big moving part of lots of things that come together, but it happens live. So it's the same thing that happens in movies, except that the equivalent would be if we got to go see them put on the movie live. But we don't do that because now there's like all this, now we see sh movies and shows with like dragons and people from metaverses and you know there's like so much stuff that goes into making that happen which is so cool visually to watch but how cool is it also to watch that same thing happen live like all the moving parts in the rehearsal has happened prior to and then you get to see it happen from beginning to end and you also get to see when things kind of crash burn too because it's real people having moments on stage like what if somebody gets a th sore throat and they don't hit the high note i've definitely heard that before it's painful humbling <laughs> and then you know the show must go on and you love it you appreciate it you're like brava girl Oh, I don't know how I would be able to pull it together after that, but bravo, you know, or whoever. Uh, it's it's just live. It's music that's live, and it's and that makes it alive, and that's what makes the experience so unique every time you go because different people, different experiences, and we are all so unique. So that's why, you know, movies are cool because they're capturing an experience. But I really love what um, something that uh, Jordan Peele said. Ah, the difference between horror and comedy is the music. Because you have to use your ears, it allows your imagination to be used. And sometimes a story needs to be told through a sound medium. His words exactly, and I was like, oh, oh. He is speaking about opera too. You know, he's got this great new show coming out uh, on Spotify called Quiet Part Loud. It's an original audio horror. I'm not sponsored for this, but like, it's so amazing because you have to use your ears and you have to listen and it allows your imagination to paint a whole picture and opera does the same thing but the visual is there happening i mean you can listen to opera and have the visual happen in your mind too i love that but it's also really cool when you see the story played out so if movie theaters were happening in real time if movies were happening in real time it would be called an opera but we don't have movies happening in real time anymore because our movies are so advanced. And the stories have shifted and we have way more detailed stories and we have we want to tell stories in more specific ways, which is great. But there are all these other ways to also tell great stories with music and it's its own unique special thing that is not translated into movies and that's why opera is still relevant and that's why it's still survives and thrives. I just think that people don't know that it can do what it does. Cause like in Germany, going to the opera is like a regular occurrence. They go every week. Like, oh yeah, we're going to the opera. It's like a part of their culture. It's a part of their experience. And for children there, it's like totally normal to go to the opera all the time. And to hear the human voice be supported by live instruments and hear what that sound sounds like. That's a very different sound.
it's a very different experience. Like there's just nothing else like it. You just have to go, you just have to go try it. So that's why I love it because that unique experience is like, oh, it vibrates, it vibrates. All right. All right, guys, that's my share for today. So thank you so much for watching. This is Opera Appreciation for Black Folks, I'm making opera equitable. Please be sure to like and comment and subscribe if you're liking my content. It really does help me continue to share this content with other people. And thanks so much. I hope to see you guys in my next week's video. Ciao.